All right. W with that little bit, I'll start with a series of uh, disclaimers. It's one of the things we attorneys do best. First and foremost, I am not responsible for any of the graphics on, uh, during the presentation, although some of them are fairly <laughs> cute. Uh, to be clear, I am not an accountant. I am not a tax attorney. I do uh, corporate transactional work which involves a, a, a great deal of merger and acquisition work. Uh, but I am not a tax expert uh, even though a fair bit of this discussion is going to cover tax topics. Uh, and along those lines, something that you are not going to get from me today uh, is any discussion of complex tax strategies such as converting a stock purchase to be taxed uh, as if it was an asset transaction under Internal Revenue Code Section 338H10. Uh, that just was my full breadth of tax expertise right there just saying that. <laughs> um, I, I'm also going to assume for purposes of this discussion that uh, the buyers and sellers don't have any issues in trying to convince minority stockholders uh, to go along with the deal. Uh, we could have an, a, a, an extended conversation about the approval requirements for various transactions, uh, liquidation rights in some circumstances to uh, uh, shareholders that don't want to participate in a transaction. I'm going to put all of that aside. Uh, also not going to try to get into any sophisticated structures as might be uh, applied in a venture capital transaction or with a private equity purchaser where they can do some very complex and strange things with really uh, loaning money for the, as, the, as the purchase price as opposed to simply pony, ponying up the purchase price. What we're going to look at today is a fairly high level, as in you know, 10,000 foot level uh, view of, of an asset deal versus a stock deal and really from a more practical perspective than anything truly technical. Okay. And with that long list of uh, 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 disclaimers, Joan, I'm all yours. Okay, great. If you could um, just give us an overview of a stock sale versus an asset sale, and then uh, we can get into um, some other parts of it. Real basic. Stock deal, the seller is the shareholder, not the corporation itself. Uh, by definition, and in, in I'll, I'll sort of take a step back after I say it, uh, all assets are included in the transaction. Uh, it's not that you're picking and choosing assets to be transferred and not transferred. Uh, and most importantly, in a stock sale, the buyer is by definition acquiring all of the liabilities of, of the corporation. That is, all liabilities of, of the entity, whether known or unknown, are going to ride along with the transaction. Uh, it, that's a, a critical issue, probably one of the, the most important issues. Having said that, however, uh, you imagine a, a lawyer makes a statement and then immediately backtracks. Yep. There are, are ways to change those things. Uh, many stock deals, the seller is going to hold back uh, certain assets such as personal items, artwork, cars, computers, uh, things of that nature. Those can be uh, either spun off or distributed out to the shareholder, the selling shareholder, uh, before the transaction is closed. And also dealing with liabilities. There's a distinction to be drawn between uh, the, the, the technical continuing liability of the corporation uh, and how, well, what's the best way to put this? Uh, the economic reality. Uh, if, I have, if, if I'm coming in to buy the stock of a corporation and there are potential liabilities, whether they're known or unknown, that I really don't want to deal with, but I still want to do a stock deal for some reason, I, I can provide for uh, ex express carve-outs where the selling shareholder assumes responsibility for those uh, liabilities, it provides representations or warranties that no other liabilities exist, uh, and then further backs that up with uh, an indemnity obligation. Uh, I, most of you are probably familiar with the term indemnity. It's like insurance, so that if a, a liability does pick up, the indemnitor, the person providing the indemnity, uh, has to step in and protect the other party against that liability, just like an insurance company is supposed to do. Uh, with that, potentially there are uh, protective provisions such as hold back of the purchase price, offset rights against uh, promissory notes, or, or other mechanisms pursuant to which 
the buyer who doesn't want to get stuck with the liability will have recourse against the seller in case the uh, in, in case the seller does not provide uh, perform on their indemnity obligation. So it sounds so, like most sellers. Um, I'm sorry, buyers are protected then with language that their attorneys can put in the document in a stock sale? You can make a stock sale look an awful lot like an asset deal in terms of what, what liabilities are or are not uh, picked up by the buyer. Uh, the, the key is to having the provisions that clearly put the liability onto the selling shareholder uh, and then backing those up. Uh, the challenge that comes into play for, from the buyer's perspective is what happens if that seller who's supposed to be responsible uh, heads off to uh, Peru uh, or, or doesn't have any assets left at the end of the day? Do they or do they not perform? Uh, the, the challenge being that if, if the seller does not perform and the buyer doesn't have assets against which to offset the liability, they can still be stuck holding the bag because that corporation that they bought has that liability. Okay, great. And then um, an overview on the asset sale? Asset sale, completely different uh, seller. The seller is not the uh, shareholder. It is the corporation. Um, typically, the assets get sold, liquidated, uh, and then the uh, corporation is dissolved and the, uh, the sales proceeds distributed to the shareholder. Um, it can involve the sale of all the assets, or some of the assets. It's really a, a, a pick and choose situation. Um, and I think very importantly from a buyer's perspective is that the buyer does not necessarily pick up all the liabilities. Uh, they will only uh, assume ex specific liabilities, uh, those that they want to have. Uh, accounts payable, for example, might be something that the, the buyer would want to have. But what they get to do is avoid some critical potential unknown liabilities uh, or pick up liabilities only to specific dollar amounts. It, it provides a, a great deal of flexibility uh, to acquire the business and know what you're getting into, or at least supposedly know what you're getting into, uh, and not putting creditors of the company uh, in a position where they can come and tap your shoulder to uh, make get good on a prior debt. Okay. Good. And then um, I know that you know there seems to be a conflict of interest in what a buyer prefers and what a seller uh, wants to get out of it, and whether it's a, a stock sale or an asset sale. Can you kind of go over some general rules? Well, general rule, pretty basic. Buyers want to buy the assets, and the sellers want to sell the stock. It's really at a 10,000-foot level that direct and straightforward. The reason that the buyer wants an asset sale, uh, well, a couple, couple reasons. First and foremost, to know that they're not going to get stuck with unknown liabilities uh, at the end of the day. Uh, they can pick and choose the liabilities. And as noted before, that's sort of not the situation with uh, a stock sale or a stock purchase. Uh, the, seller, the seller wants to maximize their net after-tax recovery and they're in a far better position to do that in a stock transaction than they are in an asset transaction. Okay, great. And let's see, uh, why don't you go into some buyer issues? All right. Um, buyer issues, and I can't emphasize it enough, uh, is that the, all the liabilities, known, unknown, remain with the corporation uh, if you do a stock sale. That's the foremost buyer issues, uh, buyer issue. Uh, to put it in perspective, any time uh, a, a buyer client comes into my office and says they want to do a stock transaction, I jump up and down and say, no, you don't. We're going to try to do this as an asset deal because you just never know. Things can go wrong. Uh, even with the uh, best intended seller and the best run business, Things can, there, there are always potential liabilities out there. Uh, why put yourself in a position when, where you might end up having to pay for those uh, at the end of the day? Just don't do it if you don't have to. Uh, sometimes they'll say, the heck with it, I need to, I'm going to, uh, and we try to protect them as best they can, but they're going to get, I'll call it speech 1A for a, a buyer, which is do not buy the stock. Mm -hmm. 
and if a seller walked in, you might, uh, <laughs> if it's going to help them tax-wise, um, you might advise them a little differently. Absolutely. If I'm representing, if I'm the other side of the, of the transaction, I I want a stock deal uh, every time. I guess with an S corporation, I'm not going to be that hopped up about it. I uh, because uh, in a stock deal, uh, I'm going to presume that my client has had the stock for over a year, uh, and the stock is a capital asset. I uh, when the stock is sold, hopefully for a gain, they're going to get long-term capital gains treatment on that. I, as opposed to double taxation, I, that that's the, the the. I'm sorry, I've jumped ahead already to the yeah, other we'll side of the you. equation. We'll move with you. <laughs> All right. So so here's the basic deal. I, I again, I'll throw the the disclaimer. I'm not the tax advisor. Uh, I'll always want to work with a tax advisor, irrespective of whose side of the transaction I'm on. I give you a difference between uh, this. This reference is a C corporation. Uh, hopefully, not to be too technical. If you have a corporation, it's going to elect a tax status uh, by default to be a C corporation, meaning it's taxed under uh, Subchapter C of the Internal Revenue Code. Or, in some cases, it can elect to be taxed under Subchapter S. The base difference there is that an S corporation, and, and mind you, it's the same corporation. Uh, there's really no distinction other than the tax treatment. But an S corporation is a tax pass-through entity. Uh, so there's one level of tax with certain exceptions. Uh, the profitability of the corporation flows through to the shareholders and they're taxed at that level. But if you're a C corpor if you're if it's a C corporation that is selling assets, the corporation is going to have a tax that's called a 35% tax rate at the corporate level. Then in the situation where the uh, sales proceeds are passed through to the shareholder, which is where you ultimately want them to end up, the shareholder is going to get hit again. Uh, this time, it's the, the level of tax is going to be long -term, presumably long-term capital gains, uh, looking at a 15%. Uh, so you're looking at a cumulative 40% tax if you're doing an asset deal in a, net, in a C corporation. Uh, a bit of an aside, I just checked, and uh, uh, the deal that was struck between Obama and uh, the GOP yesterday looks like it's going to end up maintaining the uh, long-term capital gains rate at 15% for the next two years, assuming that that gets approved. I threw yeah, in the, wonderful. May re, may, re, might revert to 20%, but right now it's looking like it won't. That's good news. Um, again, working down where the area that I shouldn't be in, which is tax, I <laughs> distinguish that 40% rate from a stock sale where you've got gain that's long-term capital gains. You eliminate the 35% uh, tax at the corporate level. Much, much better, therefore, for the, the seller in a C corporation uh, to do an, uh, a stock deal as opposed to an asset deal. We're looking to maximize the net return at the end of the day means minimize the taxes. Uh, not such a big deal if it's an S corporation. Again, an S corporation is a tax pass-through entity. There's only one level of tax. So uh, the corporation sells its assets hopefully has a gain, that gain then flows through to the shareholder, and if I get it, all, get it all correctly, the shareholder then is taxed at a capital gains rate on those gains. Good. Okay. Well, I know tax is uh, the key issue that most buyers, especially sellers, are looking at. Uh, it's what you walk away with, correct? Um, so if you can kind of touch on goodwill, non-compete, and how those are treated um, in an allocation, um, that would really be helpful. Let me give that a, a, a shot. Um, just like the buyers and sellers are at odds over uh, a stock deal for, versus an asset deal from a big picture perspective, uh, one of the key elements in every transaction is, is the allocation of the sales proceeds to various uh, uh, assets acquired. And I use the term assets acquired because that even applies in a stock deal. A stock deal, one of the assets you're going to want to preserve is the goodwill. That means that you're going to presumably have non-compete covenants. Who provides the non-compete covenant uh, and what's the allocation for that versus allocation for equipment or allocation for goodwill? Um, it's a, this is a little bit different than saying asset deal versus stock deal. 
although there are some crossover elements to it. Well, we can start with the concept that uh, generally the buyers and sellers are going to want the allocation to go to different places. Um, for a buyer, I, if I pay $100,000 for uh, assets or $100,000 for stock, that purchase price, price is a capital investment, and I don't get to deduct that. It's just out of pocket, uh, no deductibility at all. There's a bit of a difference, moving down one bullet point, if I can allocate part of the purchase price to goodwill and non-compete payments. Those payments for those intangibles uh, are subject to 15-year amortization. Yeah, excuse me, 15-year amortiza amortization. Uh, that's not great. I'd rather deduct it in year one. I'd rather deduct it over five years. But you know, if I get 15 years versus nothing at all, I'll take the 15 years. From a buy, excuse me, a seller's perspective, uh, compensation payments uh, such as well, strike that. Let me let me make a bit of a. Uh, I've jumped ahead of myself. As a buyer, my best solution is instead of allocating uh, purchase price to specific assets, including goodwill uh, or non-compete payments, is to uh, allocate it to compensation. Have an agreement with my seller, whether they're the shareholder selling shares or whether they're the uh, uh, there's an asset deal have an agreement with my seller principal to stay on board in some theoretical capacity as a consultant and pay part of the purchase price as consulting fees or possibly even uh, in, in salary. That becomes completely deductible uh, to me as the buyer. I want to stuff as much money into compensation as I possibly can. So those are sort of the priorities of preference, compensation being the highest, goodwill and non-compete, second, uh, other purchase price, third. Well, those being my objectives as the buyer or ideals, uh, it works backwards from the seller perspective. Uh, compensation and non-compete payments are ordinary income to the seller, not capital gains. Uh, it's just you pay your tax. Uh, not a good situation there. Um, there's a bit of a proviso. Uh, for personal goodwill, if I, as a seller, I can allocate payment to personal goodwill and establish that I have personal goodwill, I can take that as capital gains. Um, and I, I'm using the term personal goodwill, I probably confused some people. It used to confuse me a lot. Uh, goodwill is, the is defined as the expectation of continued patronage and profitability. Uh, a business entity, by virtue of its name, hopefully has goodwill. Uh, there's also goodwill that can be attributable in some cases to the individuals. Hopefully here in my practice, although I'm a shareholder in a professional law corporation, I would have um, excuse me, personal goodwill that if I had a non-compete covenant, well, I guess I can't say non-compete, uh, where I might sell my personal goodwill and instead of receiving payment for that uh, as uh, ordinary income, I'll take that as long-term capital gains. Uh, but that's what I would like to have in that situation. And um, Brad, is, is that you can only do personal goodwill when you are an integral part of your revenue stream? I mean, you're the one producing it. That's yes. I uh -huh. don't know of any other situation where you could take personal goodwill. It's otherwise going to be entity level goodwill, and that's going to have differing tax consequences. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, here, here's where we've got the crossover on the next bullet point to a, a situation where there's goodwill involved in the transaction. I, if I'm the seller of a corporation, or if I'm doing business through a corporation, what I'm going to want to do is take everything as payment for my stock. I don't want to look at uh, ordinary income as a consulting fee uh, or as salary uh, and have an allocation of those items. I want everything allocated to my stock. This is where I'd prefer to do a stock deal as opposed to an asset deal because I'm going to take that uh, compensation or in the form of payment for the stock 
uh, and have long-term capital gains, 15%. Uh, and this could drive me to fight really hard to do a stock deal. In exchange for that, I might have to give up a fair bit in the way of representations, warranties, uh, indemnities, holdbacks, offset rights, and the like. Uh, but at the end of the day, if I want to maximize my recovery net of taxes, stock deal all the way. Now, Brad, is this, does that apply whether it's a C-Corp or an S-Corp? Well, I've got to put on my CPA hat here that I don't have. I, no, I think I'm only looking at that in, a, as a, in the C-Corp environment. Right, okay. Just wanted to clarify that. I'm pretty sure. So if, if anybody on the phone is an S-Corp, it isn't as important to do a stock sale um, versus if you're a C-Corp, if you can get a stock sale agreed to, that's the better way to go. It might do a little bit of an aside here. Again, I'm stepping out of, out of my role, which is if, if you've got time and to, to prepare for and plan for your sale, I can consider can you convert to, uh, should you start, or can you now go to an S corporation? There's some holding period issues that are fairly extensive. Um, but if you're not looking to sell right away, uh, depending on how your assets are structured and where you might realize gain, uh, being an S corp could be a good thing, uh, which would then let you sell the assets and uh, minimize your, your overall taxes. Mm -hmm. I've even had uh, sellers feel so strongly that were C corps that they wanted a stock sale that they adjusted the purchase price, um, you know, because they're saving a great deal from that that they split the difference with the buyer. I've seen similar situations, and yeah, it. Uh, mm -hmm can be significant savings. Yeah. Are we ready for the next slide? Yeah, Are let's go there. Bottom? Well, to sort of take a half step backwards, it, uh, to the extent that you've got an allocation for uh, an intangible such as uh, goodwill or non-compete uh, payment to the C corporation, now you've got uh, sort of the worst of all scenarios. Uh, you've got a tax at the, presumably at the uh, corporate level, proceeds flow out to the shareholder, and taxed again, and we're right back to that 40% tax bracket, or cumulative tax bracket. Not a good place. Oh. Okay, I know there's some uh, other points that you wanted to touch on that can definitely change the deal. Um, touch on those. All right. I, I call these, we call them deal-changing issues. Uh, one would be licensing. Uh, we do a fair number of transactions with contractors. And what you need to have is a, a, is a contractor's license. If you engage in business at any time uh, without a, a contractor's license in place, you've got a problem. Uh, it's a misdemeanor, and your customers don't have to pay you a dime, even though you've performed perfectly. So it's a, it's a big issue to deal with it when we're dealing with a, a contracting business. A uh, great challenge is that it takes a lot of time to uh, get a new license. If I come in as a buyer uh, and, I, and I'm not set up with a license, I'm presumably going to want to buy the assets, which means I'm going to form a corporation to be the purchaser of the assets, and I'm going to then uh, need to go get a license. That means I need cooperation presumably from the seller to operate as my uh, qualifying individual to go to the contractor state license board and get a license for my newly formed corporation. Uh, it used to be that that could, was a, a four-month-plus process. I'm not sure exactly how long it takes now, but it's still a time-consuming process. And one of the things that you don't want to have in a deal is wasted time. Deals, you, you want to get them done. So that, that length of time, the need for cooperation from the seller, who doesn't necessarily know that I, as the buyer, am going to complete my deal, I which can also be a bit of a problem, makes licensing, particularly for a contracting business, extremely difficult. One of the ways to deal with that is to go to a, uh, a stock deal. Uh, the license for, the, for a contractor is held by the corporation, I, and if I, as the buyer, buy the stock, I've gotten around that whole time-consuming process I, as the seller, I would potentially or, or would like to do that. Of course, I want to sell the stock anyway, uh, and I'm going to get a quicker, easier deal. 
uh, the, the big challenge then becomes for the buyer dealing with all of those potential unknown liabilities, one of which is the, the, the prospect of uh, a, a limitations period on defective construction that lasts for 10 years after the work is complete. So we end up doing a, a fair bit of work uh, to protect a buyer in that context. Um, but the licensing, the point being, can drive everybody to do a stock deal where uh, it would be, the transaction would typically be better handled as an asset deal. Uh, another deal changer is real estate. Uh, I would never do a deal as a buyer where there's real estate involved uh, where I'm taking over the selling entity. Uh, the reason for that is hazardous materials. The cost of cleanup can be extraordinary, and anybody who ever gets into the chain of title uh, has responsibility for the cleanup. So if the, uh, the, the corporation or LLC, whatever the entity is, has owned the real estate, I'm going to buy that real estate uh, as opposed to the entity. It's just a non-starter to buy the entity. And, and Brad, uh, I know many people you know, will uh, hire somebody to do a phase one, and then it may go to phase two or three to protect them. You, you don't think it's still enough? Um, from a lawyer's perspective, never. Really? Uh, yeah, I, it, you can get some level of comfort, uh, and it's a rare occasion when things really go wrong. But from my perspective, and maybe I'm just too conservative, I look at the, uh, the, the potential liability is, is so great uh, that if it was to occur, even with a low probability, I, I'm I'm going to scream and holler at my client not to uh, take over uh, in, unless I know for for certain that there's no possible way that there was ever any contamination. And and as a lawyer, I always presume that there was. Okay, and so you're going to uh, recommend in that case an asset sale. Yeah, uh, no, I, it doesn't mean I control the deal. Right. I, and I've made many a recommendation that's not followed, but uh, there's going to be an awful lot of resistance uh, from me if there's, if there's any risk at all that there was contamination. I agree. And what about the warranty issues? Well, warranties, hopefully materials that are sold uh, or services provided or construction that's performed is without defect, and warranties don't come back and bite you. Uh, but the idea is the warranty protects the, the, the buyer of the product or the party taking the benefit of the services. And you just never know. Um, I, I mentioned uh, contractors. They effectively have residual liability. It's not technically a warranty liability uh, for up to 10 years. Uh, it's those, those situations, um, oh, you could have all sorts of, let's say you were manufacturing ladders. Uh, issue, automobiles, lots of things that could result in, in tremendous harm if there's uh, a defect. Uh, in a transaction, I'm going to look at what the, uh, representing the buyer primarily, I'm going to look at what the potential exposure is, what the, the, the likelihood is, and do an analysis as to how can we protect ourselves. Uh, I'll take several steps back to the comment about a stock deal being structured so that it, it kind of looks and feels like an asset deal in terms of the allocation of the liability exposure. Uh, if there's warranty exposure potential um, or product liability exposure potential, I'm going to want to stuff that over to the seller. Then comes the rub. Can I provide in the transaction sufficient protections? That is, I can, I can have a contract that says, selling shareholder will be liable for all of these unknown or contingent liabilities, whether they be warranty or otherwise. But if I don't have something to back that up, uh -huh. the, the writing on the paper is not worth anything. And sometimes you just can't get enough backup uh, to, to be able to justify taking the risk. And I've seen various transactions where we would have liked to have gone with a, a stock deal for whatever reason, including that's the way the way the, the seller wants to do the deal. And we avoid uh, the common enemy, which is the government collecting our taxes. Uh, we just look at it and go, can't provide enough protection, therefore we've, we've, if we're going to do this deal, we're going to do it as an asset deal and not assume the liability exposure. Okay. So it really depends on the, on the business and the industry. And Absolutely. Each situation is different. This is, uh, I throw this in uh, 
really because it is, it's a, a potential issue that could drive you towards an asset deal where everybody would otherwise want to do a stock deal. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, there are some other factors in a business sale we should touch on before we close. Yeah, um, I'm not sure that any of these would uh, drive you to one form of transaction or another, but they are things that come into play. Uh, employees and vacation liabilities and worker comp rates. Uh, if you're doing an asset purchase, what happens at the end of at closing is technically all of the employees of the seller are terminated, and then they're immediately rehired by the buyer. That's that's the technical. Uh, result. Well, in California, what happens when you terminate an employee is that you then need to cash them out of all their accrued vacation time. That's a horrible uh, thing for the buyer because uh, while the, the employees are, are happy to receive their vacation pay, in the next couple months, they're going to want their time off too. Uh, so that it, it creates a bit of an issue. Oftentimes what I'll do, and it's not necessarily the right way to do it, but from, from a practical perspective, we'll do it anyway, is have the buyer in, a, in uh, the transaction actually assume those liabilities that should have been paid off. Uh, workers' comp rate. Uh, you can have a really good workers' comp rate. You can have a bad workers' comp rate. If you do a stock transaction, uh, you take over that comp rate. Uh, and I guess I, I failed to say that in a, in a stock deal dealing with employees, uh, there's, there's not even a hiccup once you buy the stock. The employees are still employed on the same terms by the same employer. Really easy way to, uh, to go about it. So if there are material issues with employees, uh, you might want to go with an asset deal. If not, then a, then, then a, a stock deal might be more appropriate. We're saying Basis, um, about the vacation liabilities that it might be better in um, a stock sale for the buyer to assume those liabilities, meaning the seller at closing will uh, credit back to the buyer uh, what that dollar value was, but he will continue with it? Yeah, you look at it as a liability. You adjust the purchase price for it accordingly, um, and it, it doesn't impact anybody's cash flow. Uh, it leaves the employees in a position in, in doing a stock deal. You end up in the same or correct economic result in terms of the purchase price. Uh, the employees are still going to get their vacation, uh, and you're not nobody's out the cash flow. It's a it's a great approach to uh, look at it as a stock deal as opposed to an asset deal to avoid the challenges of dealing with the employees in an asset deal. Good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see again out of my area. Uh, basis and assets for depreciation. Lots of businesses get sold, uh, people looking for uh, their, their cash out upon retirement, and uh, they're sitting on assets that were long ago depreciated. Uh, they've got a, a tax basis of zero. If a buyer comes in and buys the stock, they're effectively taking over that tax basis of zero. And guess what you get to do if you do an asset deal? Allocate a bunch of money to the uh, tangible assets, uh, create a basis, and depreciate those same assets all over again. So that's, that's one of the benefits to a buyer for, for doing an asset deal. But it gets back to the issue of allocation um, that, that is often forgotten until the last minute. So a good thing to think about in advance is how you want the allocation before you approach the sale. And Brad, uh, isn't it true that if it's a stock sale, you do not have to allocate? You only need that if it's an asset sale? That is correct. But in the stock deal, you, you don't get to uh, depreciate again. Right, right. Uh, sales, sales taxes, another factor, uh, and it depends on the type of business. Um, if I'm a service provider, uh, I'm not going to be paying sales taxes. Uh, therefore, uh, I can claim that I've got a one-time sale exemption if I sell my assets, uh, and I can sell all of them, and there's no sales tax that applies. But if I've got a business that otherwise pays sales taxes on the portion of the purchase price in an asset transaction that's allocated to furniture, fixtures, and equipment, that's the FF&E, uh, somebody is going to pay the sales taxes. It'll be, you know, it can Thickly be allocated. the buyer. Yes. Uh, there might be credits for that. You can still work out the, e the economics, but there's another cost of doing the transaction simply because it's a, a, an asset deal as opposed to a stock deal. 
cons next bullet point, consents to assignment of agreements. Um, if I'm doing an asset deal, uh, there's a likelihood that uh, some of my key contracts will have provisions that say that uh, the consent of the other party is required uh, to affect the assignment to the buyer. Uh, that can be a challenge. Uh, not nice to go to your key customers and say, hey, I'm going to sell my business. Will you please consent to the assignment of my contract to my, my new buyer? Uh, that's a, a detriment in some cases to doing an asset deal. A uh, stock deal, uh, you generally don't have that issue. Uh, but beware, keep in the back of your mind, that most leases, for example, are going to consider a change in control of the corporation uh, as an assignment and therefore require consent to the assignment. Uh, truth be told, we don't always go and get that consent, uh, but uh, it, 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 it's, the need to get a consent can be a particular issue in an asset deal. What I no. found um, in that, you know, in the real estate assignment is that the uh, landlord will um, most often want the buyer and the seller to be on the hook for that if they're assigning it versus um, creating a new lease. Have you found that as well? A they want both. Yeah, absolutely. The, the general rule with an assignment is that the assinor, the party who's making the assignment, is going to remain liable as a guarantor. Uh, the assignee, the person or party obtaining the assignment, is then going to assume liability. But in the mix, if I'm the, the landlord, I want individuals on the hook. And I might withhold my consent unless I get some money on the side uh, or other guarantors, and then I improve my position. And I've seen landlords become a real problem in, in a deal. Yep, they can be. That's why I always uh, recommend a seller um, after they decide to put their business on the market to start talking to the landlord. They have, you know, the, the right to complete their their lease. So there's no everybody worries about the landlord knowing ahead of time. But I found that it it works better the longer they know about it and get used to the idea and find out what the uh, criteria is for the buyer. You know, whether it be a net worth or whatever. Um, that makes it easier going down the road. Makes sense. And the bulk sales process? Uh, I'll, I'll refer to that as a pain in the neck. Uh, <laughs> there, under the uh, uh, commercial code uh, in California, Article 6, uh, any business that uh, is involved in the sale of goods from stock, which would by the definition be retail businesses or where uh, distribu distribution businesses, uh, and also including restaurants, that sells most of its assets, I think it's defined as more than 50%, is required to go through the bulk sales process. Uh, that's a, a notice in the newspaper uh, where People can find out that you're going through a transaction that you might want to keep confidential. Uh, notices to taxing authorities, and in some circumstances, escrows. Uh, it, it's, it's, how to put it, it wouldn't stop you from doing a deal. It can create some hiccups. Uh, if there are particular issues of confidentiality, uh, it could drive people to say, I don't want to do an asset deal. I want to avoid the bulk sale process, uh, so let's do a stock deal. Uh, the, the, there are folks that will go ahead and do their deal without bulk sales compliance. The challenge there is that if you've got a transaction, and it would only be an asset transaction, that is subject to bulk sales, and you as the buyer do not go through that process, you are liable to the creditors of the buyer, excuse me, of the seller for a, a year period. Um, that that's a risk that I would typically not want to take. Uh, if you're doing an asset deal for purposes of avoiding the assumption of the seller's liabilities, it pretty much defeats the purpose to create a statutory liability to creditors by not going through the bulk sales process. And the bulk sales process is just sort of a, a nuisance. You know, the only problem that I've ever experienced with it, you've, you've had maybe more experience with it, but is that when the tax um, boards or whatever sends a notice to the company, you know, saying that they recognize it's for sale or whatever, and an employee sees that notice, 
um, you know, then that shows your cards before you maybe wanted them to see it that, you know, that the business was for sale. But if you can put a home address or some other address on there that it goes to the seller's home versus the, um, the office. But that's the only, you know, the, the thing I don't like about it, it just draws things out because you have to wait 12 business days and it takes a couple days to um, get it published. So, you know, you're up to maybe 15 days longer than a close might have to take. Yeah, I can't say that I've had anybody uh, – the, the, the issue that I typically see is with the sellers not wanting the uh, sale to become public until it's closed uh, because they don't want their customers to find out, don't want employees to find out. And the, by definition in the bulk sales notice, there's a publication in the newspaper. But I can honestly say I've never had a situation where we've gone through the process and somebody has found out about the transaction other than the, the means by which you just mentioned, John. Yeah. Um, the escrow company that we use uses a business publication, and it's one of these business publications that no one sees. It's mainly for that purpose, just this list of businesses for sale. Um, so it's, they don't put it in the Mercury or in the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, so it's, that hasn't been an issue for me. Yeah. Yeah. And then the built-in capital and credit? Well, if you do an asset, strike that. If you do a stock deal, um, presumably you've got vendor relationships that are pre-existing, and those are going to continue. Uh, so you've got credit, and one of the great things is it, when you're doing a, a stock deal, uh, you're typically buying a balance sheet, which is going to maintain uh, some required uh, working capital. Uh, so unlike a situation where you're doing an asset deal, uh, the, where the buy, excuse me, I'm getting back and forth there. The seller is take, do it. <laughs> <laughs> takes the cash with them. Uh -huh. uh, by doing a stock deal, you, you can be in a better position. Uh, or it might be somewhat easier to facilitate having capital and credit uh, as opposed to an asset deal where you as a buyer get to start funding uh, the, the capital requirements of the business, and you're probably out there trying to reestablish credit with, uh, with vendors. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's a big advantage to a stock sale for, for both, really, and mainly for the buyer, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Brad. I, I see a few questions. I thought you did an excellent job in uh, clarifying some of those for us. Uh, we had a question um, from one of our listeners who has a contracting license, and his question was, is if the RME, which is Responsible Managing Employee for those listing, stays with the company after the sale, would that minimize issues with the contractor's license? I think the short answer to that is yes. Um, whether it's a stock deal or an asset deal, you're going to need to make arrangements typically for the RME or RMO. That's RMO is Responsible Managing uh, officer, they would typically, well, they can stay on in either capacity. Uh, they're also referred to as a qualifying individual. Uh, if they leave, then you need to replace them within 90 days, and that's generally going to be a an issue. Uh, so you typically make arrangements with the qualifying individual to stay on for a couple of years uh, so that the new owner has the ability to get the experience required to obtain their own license and thus become the qualifying individual. Uh, that typically means uh, further indemnities as between the buyer uh, and the RMO uh, or, or qualifying individual uh, insurance coverage. Uh, we've, got a, we, we've got a fairly standard agreement to make that happen. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely makes it a whole lot easier. If you don't have a, a, a qualifying individual on board after the sale, uh, you really can't do, the, can't do the deal. Okay, thank you. And then another individual said earlier, were you discussing allocations under a stock sale? And I think we were referring that to an asset sale. Is that correct? Generally speaking, um, you could still, in an asset transaction, you're going to have to dump the, uh, the purchase price someplace. When I say dump, uh, make it allocate it to some category of assets, whether it's equipment, furniture, uh, intangibles, uh, non-competes. You can still have a situation <clears throat> in a stock deal where uh, if I'm a buyer uh, I'm, uh, and I'm looking to tie up 
uh, the, the, the principles uh, as shareholders, I can enter, enter into, I'll want to enter into direct non-compete agreements with them, in which case I'm going to take what would otherwise be part of the purchase price and allocate it to uh, the non-competes uh, if for no other reason than to have uh, solid consideration to uh, support the, the non-compete contract. Hmm. So there is a, a titch. It's, it's not the same issue, so it's really an asset purchase issue, um, but there, there is a, a bit of an element there in a stock deal. Okay. Um, creatively, another question was, creatively speaking, can a C-Corp sell assets to a closely related company for zero net gain then sell those assets to a buyer plus the stock, which is now worth very little? I am raising my white flag on that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first. I haven't heard that idea. Well, I think it was a Clint Eastwood that says a man needs to know his own limitations, and uh, that gets into some tax issues that, that really are beyond my expertise. Okay. So I'll just sort of decline to even try. Was there? Um, I'm going to take the group off mute in case there's anybody else that would like to... Uh, the conference has been unmuted. I'd like to ask Brad a question. Okay, that the conference ends, has been muted. That ends our webinar. I want to thank everybody so much for getting on, and hopefully it was uh, helpful to you. If you'd like to refer this webinar to anyone, you can tell them to log on uh, the Sunbelt website, which is sunbeltbayarea.net, and there will be a link to our webinars, or if there's something you'd like to hear again, feel free to do so. Thank you so much, Brad, for uh, helping us out today. Brad, thanks so much for helping us out today. You're very welcome. My pleasure. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Please stand by.